So thank you very much for attending these. It means a huge amount to me that there's so much support for these events. Um, and I have a great amount of enjoyment in um, yeah. putting all the... Uh, Where does it say that? Well, you put your sound sign up and it tells you... Sorry, I'm just going to meet a few people who are... Who are Can't see it. It says, where? Yeah, so... No, not... not there we go. Right. So, sorry, that, it throws me off when there's a, a bit of chat in the background. Um, this talk will take about an hour. It's going to cover a lot of the um, major native trees in the UK. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, tips on identifying them. Any um, identification features. Uh, with them and some of the mythology as well around them. Um, you but, want to get rid of that, say. Sorry, there's some chatter in the background. Someone's mic's on. Sorry, it just throws me a little bit. Um, but it's it's not a comprehensive uh, journey through all the trees that we get in the UK. But it's going to cover a lot of the major ones. Um, I'll just set the scene at the beginning. Um, I do like to. Uh, just put a bit of perspective onto uh, my workshops and things. So, um, just to say as well, sorry, that this will be, I will record this, so anyone who, who has technical issues, they can have a copy of it later. But also, I'll share this presentation with you. So if I go through it too quickly, and you haven't got enough time to um, jot down as many notes, or then please feel you know you've got this to be able to uh, refer to afterwards um so trees do come in all shapes and sizes we're going to use one example now which is a fairly common tree that you'll you may recognize you may not but the idea is that we're going to learn through this webinar um you may see a, a grand tree like that and you may recognize it from that form but would you necessarily recognize it in the winter when it's bare would you recognize it if it was growing next to another tree like that? So the environment very much shapes our trees. They come in all these different shapes and sizes. Would you recognize it if it looked a little bit like that? It looks not so healthy. Um, yet they're all the same tree. And the one feature that we do get to recognize the, the, the tree by usually is, is the leaf that gives it away. So you may recognize it by that characteristic there. A little bit of background behind this tree, if you're not quite sure what it is, we'll come to that in a second. In North mythology, it's the tree of life, and it's apparently where they believe that the first man uh, was uh, said to have come from. The young fruits are edible, and it contains an oil similar to olive oil, and it is a member of the olive family. So that may be a clue for some of you. It's a very grand, tall tree. 35 meters, lives for up to 400 years, and it is the ash tree. And uh, as I mentioned, it does have a fungal infection. Ash dieback has been, in, it's been around for 30 years. It came from China, but it was introduced to Britain in about 2006. Um, and it is affecting a huge amount of our, our native ash trees. And it essentially clogs the arteries of a tree. So it, it, this fungal infection causes toxins to travel up through the, uh, the vessels and it just causes blockages and it stops any uh, food getting, water getting up to the leaves. So the leaves wilt and die back and eventually the tree will die. We're looking at the same tree again, but we're looking at its many different faces. So the bark can be very different. It can be uh, furrowed with deep cracks, as you see there, it can be very smooth depending on the age or depending on where it's, it, it's living, it could have these wonderful um, moss or lichen coverages. Or it could be, again, quite smooth, and, but the shape and the, the texture of the bark can vary very uh, greatly with any of these species. One characteristic though, to help really identify it, in the winter time especially, is the bud. And the buds, um, they differ in the shape, their size, and their colour. And underneath the bud, you've either got a flower, like you've got there, a male flower of the ash tree, or it may be a female flower. Um, 
and they do grow on separate trees, although sometimes you get them living on the same tree. So you do get hermaphrodite ash trees, but sometimes you get male trees and female trees. You may recognize it a little bit more with the key. They're the young keys, they're edible. If you were to pickle them, boil them up, pickle them, um, and store them in vinegar, then they are a bit like a caper. I don't think they're very tasty <laughs> in my experience. They will age to this uh, winged fruit, which is the, this key flies off. One characteristic of um, ash is this up curve at the end of the branches. So one of the main characteristics I think is a good way, the black buds, but also that up tilting curve at the end of the, at the branches. So tree, summer, winter, you can tell on ash from that characteristic. One question that I'm asked regularly in a way is, is it coniferous or is it deciduous? But we'll just run through very briefly because the two aren't really opposites. Scots pine, coniferous or deciduous? Horse chestnut, is it coniferous or deciduous? And the European larch, is it coniferous or deciduous? Well, let's have a look at a definition. So coniferous means it bears a cone. So all the pines, the spruces, larch and seed and redwoods, they're all cone bearing trees. And they belong to a class of trees or plants called gymnosperm. It's a Greek word, which means a naked seed. So it's a technical matter. So they're all this, they all have a characteristic in their, in their seed. So the pines and the cycads, ginkgos, they all belong to this group called the gymnosperm. Whereas deciduous means they shed their leaves. So anything that uh, sheds the, so the horse chestnut, and you can see here the leaf scar where the leaves fall off and it leaves, leaves that horseshoe um, shaped kind of, uh, hence the name, well, one of the origins of the name horse chestnut is because of that feature there. But the larch as well is a deciduous tree. So a better classification would be to say, are they gymnosperms, they have a naked seed, or are they a flowering plant which belong to the angiosperm? So they have a cased seed. So a gymnosperm and an angiosperm are, are separate groups of, of trees, whereas deciduous is losing its leaf. So there's a little bit of confusion with that, but hopefully a better comparison would be to say, is it evergreen, like that western red cedar? Or is it deciduous, like that ash tree, which sheds its leaves? So a couple of other examples. Holly is an evergreen. Douglas fir is an evergreen. But the larch is a cone-bearing tree, so it's coniferous, but it's also deciduous. And beech, as an example, is deciduous. Just a little bit, I like to put the perspective onto these, these webinars. So in terms of evolution, we've got the oldest plants, the mosses, that date back half a billion years. And then we have other spore bearing plants, which are the mosses and the ferns, are the spore bearing plants. And they date back 360 million years. But then evolutionary, along came these gymnosperms, these seed bearing plants. Able there in the late uh, Carboniferous era, but then a very long time down the line came the flowering plants, the fruits and the flowers and the pollination that came along with those flowers. So they came along at the end of the uh, Triassic period, really. And then they came to great dominance, really, about 100 million years ago. So the gymnosperms, about a thousand trees in the world, the gymnosperms, 300,000 are flowering plants. So they're very diverse, but evolutionary, they came along a lot later. One final difference, softwoods and hardwoods. Technical difference, but hardwood is an angiosperm, so a flowering plant, and a softwood is a coniferous or gymnosperm, and it's all to do with the cell structure. I'm not gonna talk any more about that. You can keep these slides it's a technical matter. So you can get a very dense hardwood or you can get a very lightweight hardwood like um, a balsa wood, for instance. So we're gonna run through our, we're gonna run through four trees and we're gonna have a little break. So the first one is Scots pine we're looking at there. It belongs to the pine family. 
deeply fissured bark and you can see high up the, the, the color of the bark goes an orangey color. So they live to be about 250 years, but can live up to 600 years. You've got these beautiful cracks and fissures in their, in their bark. The needles are in pairs and about up to five centimeters long. And the male, um, you can see the male comb there with, with the like it's essential, we'll call it a flower, but they're the male, whereas the female cones develop from a green to a dark brown in about two to three years. So they'll, they'll stay on the same tree. You'll see them all in different um, stages of their development and then they're distributed. Not a huge amount of folklore or mythology associated with, with them, but there's a resin uh, which has been used as an antiseptic, the pitch pine. Um, and it's a sealing wax, so it's waterproof, used to line beer barrels and so on. Another of our three native conifers is this one, synonymous with graveyards and churchyards. Very hard to age directly, but they're very, very long lived. They get this lovely reddish brown uh, flaky bark, these pairs of needle like leaves. And then they get this, it's like a, it looks like a fruit, but it's not a fruit. It, it's um, and called an aril and it's a yew tree. So after four or 500 years, a yew tree will lose its heartwood. And so it's very hard to kind of age an, a yew tree, but they can live up to um, two, 3,000 years. There's one in Scotland, which is estimated to be about 9,000 years old, but they're incredibly long lived. That red flesh that you see on the, on the, around that cone apparently is edible, but the rest of the plant is poisonous. <laughs> um, the, the, the cone itself inside is poisonous. Um, allegedly edible, but uh, the rest is so poisonous that you wouldn't really choose to try and consume it. They've got such a long life. Um, there's 500 churchyards in England alone with yews which are older than the church itself. So they, they date back a very, very long time. Um, the scientific name uh, taxus comes from Greek, which means bow. And apparently they were used to tip arrowheads. And if that didn't kill you, then the poison of the yew would, would kill you. So they've got a double, doubly fatal. Um, and a, it's, uh, got a symbol of immortality and it's also the poison uh, that killed the king in uh, Hamlet. So Hamlet's uncle killed king by pouring some yew into the ear of, of the, uh, the king. So it's got some historical references too. Second of our native conifers is this one and it can grow really low like that but it can grow prostate but it can also grow very tall. It's got needle-like leaves and green, they look like berries, but they're not berries. You might get it from that as they turn blue. It's used to flavor drinks. Um, and it is a member of the Cypress family. So it's juniper, it's our third native conifer in the UK. They have two varying forms, but they also have two incredibly opposite habitats. So here it's living in the Lyde Valley in the Lake District. Limestone is dry. It's also found in acidic soils amongst moorland plants up in Scotland. So it likes it very, very dry and calcium loving, or it's exact opposite. And it's also got these two differing forms. So there's an oil that's been extracted from it, which has an ancient reputation uh, to cause abortion. And there's a Scottish saying about uh, giving birth under the savin tree, which is a euphemism for a miscarriage. And we all recognize its use as uh, flavoring um, gin. Our fourth evergreen tree, but it's now not a conifer, but it's a, a flowering plant. It's got a form like that in the open. It's got, at the moment, you'll see the four white petals of the flowers in these clustered flowers. The next image, you'll definitely guess what it is. Well, not after that, sorry, that, that's the trunk. But there, the red berries. You get female trees and you get male trees. So you only get the red berries on the female tree and then you get the classic 
leaf there which is spiky as you climb up the tree the spikes become less and less so it may be to do with uh, dissuading um, grazing but there is uh, the word hollin actually um, that, like hollins cross in the peak district for instance um, there's areas where they were used as fodder so they would have been planted so that they could have had um, uh, fodder for, for cows so there is evidence that you know it's a grazing plant so it would have been hedged and, and planted it's a symbol of fertility and charm against witch witches um, it's uh, yeah in pagan traditions holly and ivy represented the male and female principles of life uh, at the winter solstice known as yule and it was a 12-day festival and then became synonymous with christmas and christianity adopted it with the christ suffering with the the crown of thorns and the the, uh, the drops of blood from the red berries so it's it's got a lot of symbolism and mythology associated with it um, and it's a hot wood burns very very well now we're going to jump into a quiz so some of you have played cahoots before what you need to do is you need to type in on your phone if you have one handy apparently i can only have 50 people on a kahoot at any time so if you type in that that uh, code there www.kahoot.it then it's going to pop up with a game pin which is going to pop up on the screen now i'll read it out nine five nine zero seven nine and this is just five questions on introduced trees in the UK. So if you're not taking part actually with the device, you can still play along and see if you can get all five right. The quicker you answer, the more points you get. So we'll see how we get on with it anyway. Getting over 50. That 55 is letting more on, that's great. So we'll make a start. Introduce trees. There's a picture. What tree was introduced by the Romans? We roast the nuts at Christmas. And it was the sweet chestnut. Well done. Emma, well done for getting so quick on the buzzer. Question two. The Chilean tree, South America. Apparently primates couldn't climb it because it's too tricky or puzzling to climb if you're a primate. Some quick answers there. Yeah, the monkey puzzle tree. Well done. Britain's tallest tree, it's 64 meters. It is a redwood. No, this is in Scotland. The, the highest tree is actually in Scotland on, the, on this, from the research I've done. In England has a different highest tree, but in Scotland, we have Britain's highest tree. Is a Douglas fir. There's a giant redwood. Yeah, they're, they're all the grand. I think the highest tree in England is a grand fir, but they're all enormous trees. They're grand trees. So, yeah. Well done, David. Prince Albert introduced a German tradition. A dodgy thing putting candles on a on a first tree, but uh, spruce. Well done. And the final question in this quiz: Game of Conkers. First record in the Isle of Wight. I 
I think that's everyone, yeah. The horse chestnut, the conquer tree. So, well done. We'll just have a quick look at the leaderboard. So in third, five out of five. Fantastic. Great effort. Five out of five. What well a Rob and Emma. Quick off the buzzer. Good to answer. How you doing? Well done. Super, well done. We'll play one more of those at the end um, and it will be on fungi. But for now, we'll get back to the second half of this. Um, and we're just going to run through some of the, the deciduous trees that we get, but we're going to group them into families. Um, so you may recognise that tree. Um, big white flowers, the flowers are out at the moment, um, depending on where you are in the country, of course. But um, it is a member of the rose family, there's a clue for you. But in the winter, it turns those red berries turn, having um, come from those beautiful white flowery blossoms in the summer. So you get those, you'll smell them now, they're absolutely beautiful scent. They'll turn to these um, red berries and the leaf is very similar to the ash tree that we saw earlier. So a common name for this is mountain ash, but its name is rowan or mountain ash because the mountain ash because of the similarity of the leaf looks and the pattern, the arrangement that we see there. Member of the rose family. There's about a hundred different species of mountain ash in the northern kind of temperate hemisphere, right from China through to North America. It's happy growing on its own uh, in exposed mountain locations. Um, it's lives 200 years so it's a very long-lived tree 15 meters tall it can grow to um, widely planted to present prevent uh, or protect against witches and each berry has this pentagram which is an ancient symbol so each of these little red berries if you look in the autumn you'll see it's got a five-sided star and that was meant to be associated with magic and an ancient symbol um, sacred to the to the Celts and associated with the white goddess. Um, and in Scandinavian mythology, we heard that the ash tree was where man was born, but this is the, where in Scandinavian mythology where the first woman was born from a rowan tree. So there's a lot of symbolism with this. The berries are edible and can be made into jellies and jams. There's a little image there. Uh, with apples, it's, there's lots of pectin, so they set really well and it's a beautiful jelly that you can get from that as well so uh, yeah we are gonna stay now with the rose family but we're gonna have a look at two uh, species which are uh, our thorn bushes so I don't know if you can tell which ones they are from those images one one has the green foliage and the, the blossom whereas this one has the the blossom but no foliage. That's one of the clues between the two of them. They're both in the rose family, so you've got these beautiful white petals, five, um, five petals. So the bottom one you can see no foliage and the top one you can see the foliage. Now it may be clearer, you've got the red berry or the haw and then you've got the black, it's like a tiny, um, very very sour, astringent, um, tiny plum. So we have the hawthorn at the top and the blackthorn. So the hawthorn or the may tree, the may blossom, uh, this blackthorn is a slow tree. Um, as I said, one forms more of a bush. You can see that in its growth form there and, and shrub. The other one is a, a, a mountain tree, quite happy to live on its own. Um, there's a saying that goes with hawthorn that it's a Scottish saying, so it's a cast, not a clout, till the May is out. And a clout is like a coat. So basically, keep your coat on until the May blossoms out. And the May tree this year was out in mid-April because it was quite a warm winter. Well, quite a warm spring, sorry. And there was, in two years, in uh, Somerset, they recorded uh, in, I've got the figures here, May the 26th, it blossomed. And two years later, 
it blossomed on the 19th of April. So five weeks different in flowering of the May tree. Um, so it's very much dependent upon the spring temperatures. So it can kind of be an indicator. I like that saying about don't shed your coat until the May's out because it means that summer's finally here. So there's a good saying there. It also has a very strong, powerful scent that is kind of going over now that, that, that smell, but you can certainly smell it before you see it. Um, the hawthorn is a pagan symbol of fertility and associated with the May Day rites. Um, and the black, black thorn is, there's lots of things that seem to be associated with, with witchcraft. I've made ketchups with hawthorn before. You can make um, fruit strips as well from it. Um, it's got a, an effect on the, an, uh, is it angina? I think there's, some, there's a heart tonic that you can get from haws as well. Uh, it's good if, you're, if you've got diarrhea, it, it binds you as well. So um, both the thorn bushes, if you've got a prickle from a hawthorn, it's not as worrying as if you've got a prick from the blackthorn from the slow because you are likely to get an infection, almost certainly. Um, and those thorns are so strong, they'll puncture farm tractor tires. So they're pretty tough. Um, but uh, yeah, they're both edible berries. We're going to move on to another family now. So we've got here, uh, we're going to look at, there's a, a, a whole array of trees that fall under this family. So the wood of this tree burns well and makes a good fuel and also really good charcoal. A painkiller, aspirin, is derived from salicin, a compound uh, found in the bark of the species. So you may well know it from there. Cricket bats are made from a hybrid of two native species. One is the crack version and the other one is the white. I'm not going to tell you which it is if you're not sure yet, but it's spongy so it absorbs um, vibration. There's a picture of one of these native trees and there's a picture of the other. So they are very varied in their form. It is of course willow and the willow family. So there are 300 species of willow growing around the world. Uh, They're associated with growing wet areas and have a reputation of immortality. Um, and if you take a branch of a willow tree and you plant it in the ground, it's very likely to, to re-root, um, even if you put it in upside down. So it's got this, uh, an amazing ability to, um, through uh, a growth hormone, um, salicin, so to actually re-sprout. Um, They've got many uses, um, but if we have a look at the trees themselves, all willows are have male and female trees. So these uh, you will have seen early in the spring. Um, they look like um, they're like cat's paws, but it's called the pussy willow. So the goat willow is known as the pussy willow because of the male flowers there. Those male flowers develop and then the female um, flower there you see will become white and fluffy as lots of willows do and they will just get dispersed by the wind. And the, the leaf of the goat willow, there are other species in, in Britain which are native but I'm just going to stick with these two. It shows the, the distinct shape of the leaf there, it's fairly rounded um, and its bark has got these diamond shaped holes which are breathing pores that allow especially living in wet areas allow the movement of of, of uh, gases in and out of the tree so they're they call lenticels and they allow this movement of of uh, gases the crack willow is a much taller tree as you can see in this image here so this is the crack willow and it does crack the it does under its own weight just crack down and and branches fall off and float down and then re-establish along rivers. So that's very much a riverside tree, whereas the goat willow is more um, wetland marsh and, and both, both wetland area trees. But the, the goat willow is um, probably the commonest of, of all the willows in the country. And the most widespread anyway. Um, the bark of the Crack willow is uh, much more fissured, you can see there. 
So the, the crack willow, like that, and the leaf like this, if you were to look at a willow down by your riverside, turn the leaf over, if it's really white and hairy, it's more likely to be white willow. Um, so there are, there are differences. Willows hybridize, lots of these trees do hybridize and they're quite vigorous, some of these hybrids. So you're not always sure which species, you might not have a pure species, but you might have a hybrid. Um, if you cross the crack willow with a white willow, you get the golden willow, which is where the cricket bats are made from. Uh, the Dutch make clogs out of, of willow as well. And so they've got lots and lots of uses. As I said, the, the flowers are, you either have a male flower and a female flower on separate trees. When they occur on separate trees, there's this fancy Latin word, dioecious, and I've written it just here. And it basically means di is two, and ecio is Greek for home. It's ecology is a study of homes. So dioecious means two homes. So I'll refer to that a little bit more through the presentation. The next tree we'll look at here is, this is a hybrid uh, created in Northern Italy, but it's one of, it's, it's a hybrid of one of our most grand trees. So you may recognize those, you're driving through France or somewhere, they grow quickly, six feet a year. They are uh, very elegant, but it's a clone. So they've taken a, a part of this tree, they cloned it, and for 300 or so years from Italy this came in the 17th century in Lombardy so some of you may know it now it's Lombardy um, it grows very quickly very ornamental and it's outdone our native species again they're willows um, that is our native tree which that Lombardy has come from that species it's a tree, it's just so grand, it's, it's a fantastic crown of, of a tree. Uh, famous in Constable's Hay Wayne photo, uh, painting, sorry, from Flatford Mill in the 1820s. So it's common, again, like willows, wetland species, uh, found more in England than anywhere else, but widely planted. So this one, I took a photo last year in North Wales. So they are around the country, some veteran trees. I found that on a veteran tree website. So I was looking for lovely examples of these grand trees. And it is a black poplar. Um, not very common at all uh, because of habitat loss more than anything else, really. Uh, grand tree up to 35 meters, an aged tree at 200 years. You have male and female trees and the leaf is quite a giveaway. So that heart-shaped leaf with a point, um, you smell a balsam. There is a, actually another hybrid called a balsam poplar. There are other British um, poplars like grey or white poplar, but I've just st stuck with black poplar. They are not so common, but they are grand trees down by rivers. It got this beautiful big form, um, branches hanging down, whereas Lombardy, they, they stick up and they're far more, far more common. Um, but the reason is the reason why they're not so common now is because they're um, the seeds need to germinate in wet ground and because of land reclamation and drying the ground for agriculture the germination isn't as effective so it's on a downward spiral sadly because of our drainage um, there's a photo of the, 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 the flowers forming and developing uh, I think they're, I can't work out, I think they're female looking at them there. Um, the wood is resistant and very spongy, like a lot of willows, a spongy wood. Good floorboards, wagon wheels, it's coppiced well, um, hence you can get these, these, these rege regeneration. Um, great for clothes pegs, thatching, spars, and uh, fruit baskets. So again, like the willow, the texture of the willow, that pliability. Now, one more tree we'll look at in the willow family is one that isn't as common now, um, but these are taken, they're two individuals sat together on a non-windy day. And this, I was out walking last week, close to home, and I saw this, and you can see the color of it when it's um, in the wind. So the leaves tremble, that might be a bit of a clue, or they quiver, some of you may know it from that. Um, 
again, like willows, they have these lentil cells, these diamond shaped breathing pores on their stem. Um, catkins and the beautiful round leaf and the stem that the leaf comes down to is flat. So when the wind catches that, it quivers or it shakes and it is aspen. So tremula from to tremble. Aspens are dioecious, so they have male and female trees, separate trees. The rounded leaf with those uh, irregular teeth, um, they flutter. They grow to about 50 years. They do clone, so they will grow from underground shoots. So one tree, uh, there may be one next to it from underground suckers, and you might get a line of them. So some die, but because of this vegetative growth, they can survive in an area. They like the, the cold, wet conditions, really favoured more in Scotland now, but they're part of our original wild wood, our native, um, and they colonised at the end of the Ice Age. So they've been around in, in the UK since the Ice Age has left. I'm going to move on now to the birch family. Uh, there's about 160 odd species of birch. This one likes wet conditions and you can see it sprouting at the base. That sends up shoots from the base. It's got small brown cones but they're not really cones, they're flowers and the, the wood when it's cut turns a deep orange and you can add sulfates to this and you can create all sorts of different colours and they've been used to make dyes and the wood's very hard and rot resistant so it's good for making clogs, makes an excellent charcoal it unseasoned or seasoned, it doesn't burn very well, but the charcoal, when the water's driven out and they've um, evaporated all the oils, it's a very, very hot temperature. So it's a very good charcoal and it is older. 28 meter tall tree, lives to about 60 years and its Latin name, or its scientific name, glutinosa. So the young twigs are quite sticky. So if you were to go out now and have a look at some of the young and just feel how glutinous or sticky the young leaves or the young shoots are sorry um, that's where its scientific name comes from the green dye uh, was used to color and camouflage clothes in Robin Hood's day um, so there's a huge number of uses of, of this very varied uses um, we've got a picture there of this is the male um, flower and this is a very young female flower and then this is a fertilized female flower looks like a cone so there's the male cone and then the leaf is a kind of a blunt it's tooth and jagged but very blunt ended it's got deep roots and it can fix nitrogen so it really enriches the soil around itself so uh, so it can withstand drying out as well because of, so it's a really uh, common wetland tree much more common than the the, um, the aspen or the uh, poplar. So this is another tree in the birch family which that's its form grows about 12 meters it doesn't grow with a single trunk but many stands. Beautiful coppice and some of the, the trees will live about 80 years but a coppice can live over a thousand years on a well coppiced environment. The male catkins extend in January so lamb's tails you may know them the next image is a tiniest little red flower. I'm not sure if you got it by this. It's so hard to see that. But you get both on the same, same tree. The leaf isn't particularly descriptive or, you know, it's the shape of the form of the tree, which is more descriptive. But the nut is the thing that we might recognise a tree by. And who likes Nutella? Each jar contains 20, 52 hazelnuts. And Ferrero apparently consumes the company, the Italian company, a quarter of all annual hazelnuts from around the world every year. So um, hazelnuts, again, the birch family, as I said, it can grow to about 12 meters, live over a thousand years on a coppice. And then because the flowers of the male and the female are on the same tree, there's this word here, Mono isio basically means one home. So the flowers have one home on that tree. The Celts considered it a tree of knowledge. A hazel rod is supposedly protected against evil. 
as well as being used for water divining. I, I met a water diviner many years ago in the Isles of Scilly who could talk to his rods of hazel and he could, he could speak to them and they would tell him how much water there was and how deep it was. And he was incredibly accurate. And he even found some ley lines of an old labyrinth underneath a maze. Um, and then many years later, it was excavated and his ley lines showed the original center of an old ancient labyrinth. So his divining was using a hazel. So it's got some uh, functions there, as well as these straight poles and hurdles and fences and, and things like that. So it's got many, many uses and it's uh, fantastic to see a, cop a well-managed coppice of hazel. Um, still within the birch family, we've got two main species of birch that we get in the UK. One has these beautiful hanging or pendulous, hence the name, hanging or pendula um, branches. The other one is less hanging and a bit more stout, but this, the, the name pubescence gives it away. So one is hanging and one is hairy. So they are birches, silver birch and downy birch. Key differences, on the silver birch you get this brown uh, twig but with these whitish warts whereas on the downy birch you get you can't maybe see it there but it's fuzzy it's a very hairy pubescent um, uh, appearance. Silver birch is a little bit more silver and papery than the downy birch. To confuse matters they hybridize incredibly quickly and easily but the form of the tree maybe it it's a uh, very um, you can look there, you can see it very young and papery, or it's old and more fissured, more ridges, but there's a lot of lichen coverage. But the key thing that you can look at are the these are the male catkins here hanging down, and then this is a female catkin, which at the moment you'll see them if you look at a birch, big like cigar shaped, um, kind of fertilized um, fruits there that, that you can see. The leaves are very similar. Um, look for the hairs, that's the key thing. They hybridize, so you might not get a pure silver birch or downy birch, but you may get a hybrid of the two. Um, and again, look for the characteristics there. So um, a couple of things to, to, to pick out there. They're pioneer species, they don't live that long, but they grow really quickly and they're really good for uh, nursing other trees to come through. So they're really hardy and yet they're so delicate, but um, many uses. Um, very sweet sap, so there's lots of sugar, so it's a bit like a maple syrup, you can tap the sap, um, you can ferment it as well. Um, high oil content in the bark allows it to be used as like a skin for a, an open boat or canoe, or roof shingles and things, so there's some good uses with that. And it's got a historical, mythical uh, symbol of renewal and purification. This tree, uh, the art, apparently I've just learned that the art of writing on this tree has dates back to the uh, Roman times. And the Romans said, as these letters grow, so may our love. So you can see there it's written, it's very smooth bark, gray, it's very silky finish. Uh, you may know what the tree is, it's the next family we're looking at. Um, it was thought to be a Roman introduction, but it's been in existence in the UK for, from pollen record for about 8,000 years, pre-becoming an island. So before we became an island, there's evidence of these in the UK. They've got this fantastic crown, beautiful light that you get from the beech tree. Go to 40 meters, 180 years, and they've got this beautiful, silky, soft leaf. And if you were to go and harvest them now, they're great and they're very young and they're edible. Put them in the salad. Um, not a lot lives underneath the uh, beached forest because of the hard husks. Um, there's also not much, they produce so much shade, there's not a lot that grows underneath them. But also the husks take a long time to break down. So, um, but, the leaves, uh, I've made uh, an alcoholic drink. You can see here a noyai, 
uh, goes back about three or four hundred years in the UK, an old tradition with gin and a little bit of brandy and sweet water. Really nice drink, got a kind of uh, spicy flavour. The nuts are used as a coffee substitute and oil uh, for cooking. Um, but it's a very feminine tree. So mythologically, it was the female tree. It's the, the queen of the forest, and whereas the oak is the king of the forest. And we're going to have a look now at two very similar species. In the beech family, uh, they are both, uh, well, shall I tell you what they are? I, I might wait a little while. They have these catkins. Um, they are oak. They do hybridize very effectively, um, but the sessile oak, they both grow the similar age, similar height, um, but the key difference is the acorns on the sessile oak, they don't have a stalk, whereas the acorns on the peduncular oak have this long stalk and then the acorns are born on that, whereas the leaves of the sessile oak have the stalk and the leaves of the Peduncular oak, sometimes called English oak, doesn't have a stalk and it has two little earlobes that come out of the bottom of the leaf as well. So there are characteristics that separate them, but there's also some great similarities and also confusingly hybrids are very vigorous with them as well. So um, difficult family or different, difficult to identify, but looking for certain features. We're going to have a look at two families now. Um, the first one, you may recognize that, that form of a tree. They like calcium. The, the hybrid, which they hybridize very effectively, they produce a very tall, elegant tree there. Um, and that's more common, but it's a hybrid of the native tree. And it is the lime tree. So there are two native lime trees the large leaf line and the small leaf line. Similar height, but the leaf size is different. But the common line, which you can see here, you can see at the base, it's suckering from the base. Whereas the large leaf line, you've got that clear ground. Whereas the, and these are far, far more common and very romantic kind of um, history associated with them. I know there's some people in the audience tonight who know Kent well, very, in Suffolk very well. And there's a beautiful avenue, uh, a fantastically romantic avenue of common lime in Kentwell called the Long Melford, planted in the 1670s. And limes are commonly planted. Um, the aphid produce that on the leaf produce this honeydew, which if you were to sit underneath it, you get this sap that falls on you, this dew, if you park your car under it or it's good for a sandwich because it can sweeten your sandwich. If you were to eat a, a leaf, it's got a quite a sweet flavour. Um, but uh, you can hear a huge buzz in kind of late June, July, around there where the, the flowers are out. And the flowers look like that. And then they form these hard nuts. And again there, you can make a tea from the flower. It's got a mild sedative, so a nice evening tea. Um, and the leaves are so similar. They naturally hybridize. Um, small leaf lime, large leaf lime, they both like the same conditions, lowland, calcium loving, chalkland, um, but they occupy different areas. The Pennines, uh, the Cotswolds, the Mendips, Lincolnshire, they are, they're not one in one area and one in the other, but they do have their own habitat. Where they meet together, they will hybridize. Um, oh, sorry. Um, the woods used to make piano keys. Uh, you can make tea, um, and it's just used in Morris dance because it's it's flexible and doesn't splinter. The last one I'm going to look at now is um, I don't know. It's hard to recognise a tree from that form, but there's one of these is native, and one of them is introduced. Uh, introduced a fair number of years ago they do produce this fruit that's wind dispersed and you'll see these right at the moment on both the leaf is a giveaway on this so it's got a little point here and a serrated edge but as you come down to the bottom one side is short here and the other side 
lobes down and around. So they've got an asymmetrical leaf at the base and that's a dead giveaway for elm. So the witch elm is native and the English elm was introduced in the Bronze Age. Um, which elm grows to 40 metres and it has large leaves, up to 16 centimetres. English elm, smaller leaf and a smaller tree. So this tree I found in North Wales. This one's in North Wales as well, but um, there's the odd individual of the English elm because they succumb to, sadly, another fungal infection from a, carried by a beetle in the bark of the elm tree. So um, the, the trees do sucker from the base. So English elm suckers really effectively, which elm less so. Um, but the, um, it, they've got this history of this melancholy. I don't know where that's come from and death. Um, dead branches will drop without warning apparently from these trees. Um, the, the name witch doesn't come from a witch, but it comes from an old English for supple. And it's where the word wicker has come from as well. So witch has led to it because it's supple wood and flexible wood. Um, but its use in the past has been for coffins. Um, but foliage, the leaves are, are really rough. If you were to rub it against your skin, it's very, very rough. But um, good fodder food for, for cows. So it would be planted widely in hedges. So that's the end of all that talk. We're five two now, so um, it's not comprehensive talk of all of the trees that we could find in the UK, but it does cover a lot of them. Um, and the major native ones, there's some that I've missed out that are introduced that are common, but it's about identifying and, and hopefully you'll, you'll go from, you know, looking at, at the trees, maybe in a different light now, um, and, and noticing different things about trees or, um, but they're complicated because trees naturally hybridize and that's what makes it quite frustrating to say, is it this tree or that tree? One thing though, the, the next quiz is um, on fungi. So fungi are associated with trees, some are specifically associated. And this is just a nice little look at five different trees um, with associated fungi. And it's another Kahoot, so we'll boot this up. And we'll get a new code that appears. And the code, 803. Seven four zero. I think people will still be able to join the game pins on the bottom there to the first. Hen of the Woods is associated with which tree? Common woodland tree, a grand tree. The oak tree, the Hen of the Woods chicken of the woods associated with the oak tree. Well done Anne. Tar spot fungus grows. There's the leaf, that might be a giveaway, it's one that not covered today because it's an introduced species. So it doesn't cause harm, but it's always associated with that one species, sycamore. It's meant possibly got a link with um, clean air as well. So the more tar spots you have, the cleaner the air. So well done. Fly agaric is an association with the roots of the...
also with pine trees, but it's one of those four that you've got there. So it lives amongst the roots of this pioneering tree, birch tree. Difficult, but whenever you see a fly garret, always look at the trees around and it will almost guarantee to have birch around, so yeah. King Alfred cakes, great for lighting fires, or for bushcraft, sorry, for taking a spark and on a dead limb of which native tree. Bushcraft people may know this. And King Alfred burned his cakes and that's what apparently they look like, the ash tree. Well done, Anne. And the final, Jew's ear fungus grows on the dead wood of which tree? It's edible. I don't like it, a bit chewy. But I made an omelette with it once. And it's the elder trees, one that we've not covered today, but. Um, there we go, we'll have a look at the leaderboard. Well done, Anne. Difficult, very difficult, but hopefully it's more learning than uh, getting them all, all correct. But five out of five, well done to Alistair. So yeah, hopefully you'll enjoy that, just a little bit of fun. Um, It's right at the end of the webinar now. Um, Hello. Oh, he's back. I am sorry. My network, my network never drops out and it just dropped out there. So I'm not <laughs> sure exactly what happened. Um, wow, that's <laughs> technical issues. Um, I just. I'm just finishing off. I've never had an issue with my network at home. So uh, there we go. Um, as I was just saying, opportunity, you know, I hope you enjoy these, these webinars. Um, I really enjoy putting them together. I find it really daunting and really frustrating and difficult not being able to interact with you. Um, I've got a couple coming up in June. So Paul Gannon will, will lead a story next week in the mountains of Britain. Then the following week, um, people requested one on mountain flowers and then alpine flowers the following week. I'll share this presentation with you afterwards so you can refer back to it. These are the books where I, I get information from. Um, superb collection of books, really important for identification, but also the mythology and the, and the uses and so on. Um, in terms of review and feedback, those of you who've done this before, it's you, you type in menti.com or www.menti.com and you enter a code which you will be prompted. It's 811948, and then it will just you'll all be able to see it now. I'll share the screen. It's an interactive uh, review. Just see what you thought of the event. Um, and what you may want in the future. So the code again is 811948. It's at the top of the um, page there that I've shared. Thank you very much for your feedback. It's, it's, really, it's really good to have this facility really see uh, what people think of it so interesting lots of information I know it's going to take a long time to absorb it but hopefully it will help you in the journey of, of your own discovering of, of, of uh, trees as well and the fascinating world um, this information will keep coming in I'm just going to jump forward to the next slide which is uh, what you thought of it? That's fantastic, great. And then 
what future webinars you might want. Um, Alpine flowers I can do, other aspects I'll have to call in the uh, assistance from other experts. It's uh, on that, but that's brilliant. So there's lots of information coming in. Um, It'll take me a minute or two to uh, process all of that, but I will share it with you later. Anything ML related? Well, we've got Joe Begley, who's been assisting me, who I've been asking to run a webinar on something ML related. So maybe he'll put one together. Uh, I'll support him. Wooden plants, yeah. um, meadow plants in Britain, edible mountain plants, club mosses and so on. So yeah, no, that's, that's wonderful. Thank you very much. For that feedback and um, yes I uh, yes yeah, thank you all very much for attending I really really appreciate it I'd love to interact with you but um, no I uh, yeah I get your feedback from from that uh, quick review there so thank you very much and uh, Hopefully, we'll see you at future webinars as well. They're going to run through June, and maybe if we're allowed out um, more freedom July, it may be that we're all out and about enjoying our natural world by then. So, uh, anyway, for now, I'll say thank you very much, and uh, hopefully, we'll see you again. <laughs>